This is an Ant Podcast Management production. Hello and welcome to What the Faux Travel Podcast. I'm Amy. And I'm Nick. We've been together since 2008. And instead of saving for our future, we spent all our money on traveling. What is a pension and should I have one? (laughs) Strap in as we take you on adventures around the world. From the high mountain tops to reporting from under the deep blue. There isn't anywhere we won't take you. Where are we off to today, Amy? Today, we're off to Austria. Hello and welcome to What The Faux Travel Podcast with Nick and Amy. Hello guys, thanks for joining us on our Austria episode. We're going to start this episode with something we haven't done in a while. We're going to do some shout outs. Yeah, so guys, we've had so many lovely messages uh, from you because actually doing this series, we haven't done any shout outs or anything pre-pandemic, have we? Because... Well, obviously it was a pandemic. We weren't traveling, so we didn't have a series. But yeah, so in the meantime, we've had so many messages from you. I remember some of you have said that you've binged all of our episodes again during the pandemic, which to us seems a bit mad. Um, But I guess we do that with our favorite TV shows and stuff. But yeah, some lovely messages. Let's start with Michael Lee. Is he your relative, Amy? Yeah, I mean, is that my cousin? That's my maiden name. (laughs) It's it's L-I-E, this one. Michael says, and this was months ago, I don't know when. Oh, January. Michael said, hello, you two. First time listener from New Zealand. New Zealand. And he loved our turkey podcast. He then asked us uh, for an Airbnb we had in Ankara. But then he went on to say, you legends, hope you're keeping well. I'm moving over to London in late July. So we're recording this in April after his travels. And he'd love to grab a beer with you both. With you both? With us both. Already hooked onto the podcast after one listen. Oh, no way. After one listen. Jesus. I told him we're not in London. So I said, if you come to Manchester, we'll have a beer. (laughs) We're not going to travel to you, basically. And then he said, nah, you're right. (laughs) (laughs) So, Michael, uh, all right. So you haven't moved here yet. When you do, let us know. I'm going to hold you to that beer. Yeah. We also had a message from Jess on Instagram. Jess underscore NSM. New South Manchester. (laughs) (laughs) If you know, you know who you are, Jess. Uh, She said, hi, Nick and Amy. I came across your YouTube channel yesterday. YouTube, hello. (laughs) I forget we have a YouTube channel. Thanks for the- So do I. Thanks to the few people that do uh, watch our YouTube channel. Um, So this is cool. Uh, She found us through our YouTube channel and we helped her a lot because she's about to do a trip through South and Central America. She said, your videos are great. Really helpful for my planning. Lovely. Oh, nice. Well, I actually still have about eight months of footage to cut together for our YouTube. But, you know, full time job and normal life kind of gets in the way of that. And obviously doing this podcast on top. But I do one day hope maybe when I'm retired, I'll I'll get to it with my little editing software as a granny. One day I'll get to it. Uh, We also uh, need to give a shout out to Tom and Josie. Uh, They've been in touch quite a lot recently. Who's Tom and Josie? (laughs) Well, I think we should get a restraining order because I just saw, (laughs) I literally just saw that Josie has gone through our entire Instagram and liked every single photo. That's serial killer (laughs) behaviour. And they often send us videos of them like at home cooking while they're listening to our podcast so they're actually they are friends of ours they live like round the corner from where we live in manchester new friends i should add i always find it really awkward when we talk to friends like yeah oh yeah like the podcast comes up every now and then but i'm like but don't worry like you don't have to listen to it you 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 don't want to you don't want to waste your time with that Uh, (laughs) but they did and they're one of the few friends that actually liked it (laughs) and carried on listening (laughs) and now they're actually unhealthily hooked (laughs) No, it's nice. Thank you for the support, guys. We do appreciate it very much. But I mean, we're probably coming out of your speakers in your kitchen right now. What are you cooking? Let us know. <laughs> Get a life. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So is, is that all for shout outs? It is all for shout outs. I'm going to bring back my favourite feature, which is hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
yeah. We did this. We've, I think over the eight years or so we've been doing this podcast, I think we've got about three hate mails. I mean, not all. There was one really bad one. Only one I, bad one. I don't think this one's like that bad, is it? But when you've made it successfully, that's when you get hate mail. <laughs> uh, from Sosa Barbosa. I mean, I'm loving the name. Are you a character from Parts of the Caribbean or something? <laughs> I think there's a Barbosa in parts of the Caribbean. Is there? Sosa Barbosa. She said, uh, hey, I just listened to your old podcast about Uruguay. That was a few years ago. I heard your comment that the geography is boring. So I encourage you guys to go back sometime and visit Minas. Are you trying to copy Brazil? Try to visit Minas or the Rolling Hills. Sounds pretty boring to me. <laughs> Uh, she said, you, you, missed, uh, you missed some waterfalls and some epic hikes. Yeah, we did a lot of that in South America. Um, but no, this is actually, this wasn't our fault. This was the couch surfing. <laughs> it never is. It is never our fault. The couch surfing host we stayed with, he's from Uruguay, and he said himself, Uruguay, there's nothing special. It's quite boring. So I blame him. So don't put words in our mouth, okay? If you're going to send us hate mail, don't say it was us. <laughs> no, we're joking. No, we, we actually do. We love a bit of feedback, but we actually didn't say your country is boring. <laughs> we then sent her back a really nice voice note, taking the time to reply to her. And I don't think she then ever said anything back. Oh, did she not? No. Oh. oh, well, Barbosa. I mean, come on. If you're holding other people to account, hold yourself to account first, okay? Come on, Sosa Barbosa. <laughs> uh, no, thank you, everyone, for getting in touch. Just the fact that you listen and reach out, whether it's positive or negative, it, it's all good. We, we love the conversation. Let's keep it going. Yeah, definitely. Should we uh, head on with the episode? Let's talk about Austria. Let's. So coming up on this episode, you're going to hear a lot of the usual features. So game show facts, language lessons with Anna and Dominic this time, some locals from Austria. Uh, we're going to give a bit of a regions chat. So an overview of the country. Then we're going to delve deeper into some of those regions. We're going to be talking about saunas or saunas, uh, a word that I find incredibly difficult to say, Swarovski crystals. <laughs> we're going to be talking about Seefeld, Vienna, lots of history. We're going to be playing a game called Daddy Issues and you're going to find out what the hell is going on here. So kick it off for us, Nick. Let's hear some game show facts. L lift off. Austria. Formerly the Republic of Austria is a landlocked country in the southern part of Central Europe, lying in the Eastern Alps. It is a federation of nine states, one of which is the capital Vienna, the most populous city and state. The official language is German and they use the Euro. Austria played a key role in both World War I and World War II, which we'll go into detail later in the episode. Austria is one of the world's most eco-friendly countries. About 63% of waste is recycled, and most of the electricity comes through the use of renewable energy sources. Skiing has been the most popular sport in Austria for more than 100 years. In Austria, it's considered bad luck if you share a toast and don't maintain eye contact with the other person. Austria is always among the countries with the highest standards of living in the world. Austria is the birthplace of some of the world's most famous artists, for example, Gustav Klimt and Egon Schneil. <laughs> Lots of famous people were born in Austria, to name a few. Arnold Schwarzenegger, former Hollywood actor and governor of California. How did that ever happen? Mercedes F1 team principal, Dodol Wolf. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Dodol Wolf. The founding father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. Christoph Waltz, an Austrian actor, has won two Oscars for Best Actor in a Supporting Role in Glorious Bastards in 2010 and Django Unchained in 2013, as well as many famous classical music composers such as Mozart and Mahler. <laughs> the single highest selling energy drink on the planet, Red Bull, was created in Austria, and Vienna has been named the world's most livable city in 2019. That was a good year before the world ended. <laughs> <laughs> it, 2020 was not a good year. I saw a job going in Salzburg for the Red Bull team. I might go for it because then I can move to Austria because it is an incredible country. One of the most livable countries in the world. There you go. Right. Love it. Thanks for the game show facts. We are going to move on swiftly. Now it's time for language lessons. Hey, I'm Anna and I'm the press manager of the Öztal Valley. Hi, I'm Dominic. 
I am responsive for Google as destination manager and I'm glad to meet you. So with language lessons, we like to teach tourists how to speak a bit of the basic language. So this was a little bit different because we have two different accents, dialects of German, but the Austrian version. So I'm going to ask you both the simple questions to see like the difference. So starting with you, Anna, how would you say hello? Hello. <laughs> hello. Oh, that sounds quite, quite similar. <laughs> how about thank you? Danke. Danke. Now, can you two hear a difference in each other? Uh, this word maybe not, but maybe another word. Yeah. Let's try please. Bitte. Bitte. But they're like they're really, <laughs> yeah. really common words, maybe, so they're um, not different. Uh, maybe yeah. like maybe tourists will need to know. Can you help me? Kannst du mir helfen? Kann du helfen? Yeah. Did you say the same thing there? Yeah. That, yeah. Maybe that's yeah. the dialect thing. Yeah, that's yeah. one part. Of, yeah, that's one sentence where where it's a little bit different, or where you kind of hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there something like a, a special sentence that we can learn that's very uh, particular to your region, maybe? Uh, yeah, let's say in Kenton. Okay. What does that mean? Uh, to make a fire. Okay. Yeah. But you would only use it in gurgle. No, in the whole valley. Okay. The, the dialect Ots, is Ottal Valley. Ottal Valley, and the the dialect from Umhausen far up to Koglitz, it's pretty the same. And the lower part of the valley, it's it's more like the the Intal, the next valley. So yeah, as high the mountains, the language is is special. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's the word again? Inkenten. 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 Yeah. In Kenton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, for example, like I have a really different word for that. Like I live only one hour like away from his hometown. And for me, the word is Einheizen. Wow. Yeah. Very different then. Yeah. yeah. That, that's maybe one word which uh, is really different. Yeah. Mm. How is Austrian German different from German German? Is there a difference? Yeah. German is like school German. It's very official. Yeah. And in, in the center of Germany, it, it's like in the, in the books. And if you, yeah, in the mountains, it's, it's quite different. Or also in Vienna. Or also in the, in the eastern part of Germany. You, it's not the, not the same language. Uh, uh, also in Switzerland. It's all the same, but same, same, but different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you think German is a romantic language? Uh, I don't know. How is it for you? Yeah, maybe, maybe it's for like okay. foreigners. It, to be honest, okay, maybe like Italian or Spanish yeah. is, but German, we think in England, we think is very aggressive. Yeah. Like, okay, but, 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 no, no, in, no, but my, in a funny way. In, no, but I, I, I'm joking, but in English, we say butterfly. <laughs> In German, you say Schmetterling. Schmetterling. <laughs> Maybe that's the reason why we don't, we've never won the song contest. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you do on the Eurovision? Do yeah. you do quite well? That's why. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, my final thing I'm going to ask you to do is yodel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that's so good. One more time. Anna, it's your turn. No, no, I can't do it. Like, you are the, you are the expert. Hold the right Wow. Thank you, Anna and Dominic. And pff, that is not the only yodeling you're going to hear in this episode. Oh, there is more coming. There is a yodeling competition coming up at the end. Oh, I really don't know how that's going to go down, but hey, I'm up for it. Let's do it. When we went to Austria, we were actually on a press trip, hence why we've been able to get so many local voices on here and experts telling you about the country. But it was a massive press trip, so there were like 40 journalists and us <laughs> that oh, yeah. were there. Everyone was split up in, I think, was it four or five different groups? We had different itineraries and we got to see different parts of the country. We started together and then went to our region and then ended together. So you got to hear what other people experienced, which was so cool. I felt like it helped us learn more about the country rather than just hearing and seeing what we saw on our particular itinerary. 
So now we're going to give you a brief overview of some regions in Austria, but we will be handing over to some local experts to go in depth onto some of them. Into some of them, I should say, but we can't go in depth on all of them, but a brief overview on some regions. These are places that we couldn't go to on this trip. Uh, there's a place called Graz. Uh, this is Austria's second largest city and one of its hidden secrets. Uh, it's a historic city which is perfect for food lovers. It's in the south of the country and like I said, if you love your food, apparently this is the place to go in Austria. And something that's really cool about Graz is there's like a there's like a hill, a little mound <laughs> in uh, in the city. You walk up this hill and when you get to the top, you can go down like the world's largest underground slide. I'm quite upset we didn't get to do this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like it looks so much fun. You get a nice view of the city and then you can slide down in I, well, I don't know, seconds, minutes. If it's the largest one, it'll probably take quite a while to get down. But I've seen pictures and it looks so much fun. Uh, there's also the region of St. Johan, which is in the state of Tyrol. Now, we did go to the state of Tyrol. That was our area. A place called Zillatal, which is not too far away. But we didn't go to St. Johan. Now, this place is perfect for families and nature lovers. So you can go on like easier hikes and climbs. Or you can just spend the whole day chilling out, sunbathing. But the point is, this is quite a relaxed place in nature, which is perfect for families. So those are some of the areas that other groups went to. But now we're going to hear from the local experts about their regions, because you don't want to hear it from us, two English laymen. So hi, my name is Helena. I'm with the Vienna Tourist Board. I take care of media relations for the English speaking countries. Is Vienna the best city in the world? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's difficult for me to really make that bold <laughs> statement. But yeah, personally, I would say so. Um, I mean, I was born and raised in Vienna, so I, I know it really well. Um, but I know from so many visitors I've talked to during the last eight years in my role at the Vienna Tourist Board, that um, it really has an exceptional outstanding position as a city it's it has it's very well functioning um, it's full of history and culture of course more than 100 museums um, you have green spaces you have more than 50 percent of the city surface being parks woods um, vineyards even we have our own wine production in Vienna so yeah lots of things that contribute to Vienna's um, standing as many international rankings say so, most livable city in the world. So the cost of living for locals, you know, rent, buying a house, paying for food, is the cost of living compared to other uh, capital cities in, in Western Europe for sure. Uh, yeah, how is the cost of living? Do you think it's good value here? I think it's it's really outstanding position that Vienna has here and it's kind of a misperception of Vienna being elegant and clean and nice, which is all true. But sometimes people think that automatically means that it's very expensive, but it's not. When you look at the average rent prices, but also when you look at the average hotel prices, they're much lower than people expect. Um, so you really have an amazing value for money. And how would you characterize local people here? Yeah, what characteristics and personality traits do you think they have? Well, I think Viennese are, um, they're quite relaxed. They're very like, we, we like to really have our coffee for an hour and we like to take time for enjoying food, but also arts and culture. Um, so rather laid back. Um, some think it's a bit, the whole atmosphere might be a bit slow compared to Germany or, or, or other cities that are very, also that are bigger simply and where more business is going on and it's really um, more stressful. I think that's also something that makes us uh, so yeah relaxed and happy in Vienna that it's kind of the whole pace is a different one. Two worlds are combined. So we have this well-functioning, efficient style of the Germans, but also the enjoyment of food, the relaxed, uh, the savoir vivre, if you want, of Italy and France. And this combination makes Vienna so special. Do you go to the opera? I do. I do. I, I have to admit, I prefer going to the theatre than going to the opera. I like language more when it's spoken and not, <laughs> not like um, sung, but, um, but yes, I do. That means you're posh and fancy. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's one more area that we wanted to get some more in-depth information on. It's not a place that we were going to, 
but this region in particular had us very interested. Hi, my name is Katrin and I'm working for the Vorarlberg Tourist Board. Uh, Vorarlberg, that's one of Austria's federal states and we're the most western one, uh, sharing borders with Germany, Switzerland and Liechtenstein. That was, that was a perfect introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so we were talking to you earlier today and I was, I was struck by how um, unique or how special your area of Austria is, um, like summer or winter. So can you explain the wide variety of things that your area of Austria can offer any time of the year? Uh, yeah, for all that has a big variety. And what I really like about our region is that you have the lake on one side. So we have uh, we are bordering Lake Constance. But on the other side, you have the mount higher mountains and you can discover it like uh, at one place with Vorarlberg. So, for example, um, if you're here in spring, you can still go skiing in, for example, Lech or another um, of our mountain regions. Uh, but then in the afternoon, like grab an ice cream around uh, the town of Bregenz or go um, on a golf course uh, somewhere close to the lake. So I really like that combination. And I think that's something quite special about Vorarlberg. And so yeah, in the summer by the lake, like... It's hot. The temperature's hot, like 30, 35 degrees. You can swim in the lake as well, right? So it's a, yeah. a real like summer holiday vibe. Yes, yeah. You should really go for a swim in the lake. And is it Lech, the ski town? Lech, Lech yeah. Lech. Lech. What, why is it so famous and posh and fancy? <laughs> yeah, it, it feels like everyone knows Lech. Uh, I think it's the oldest ski club in the world, actually, the ski club Alberg. And so they always had good connections to, to the US and to Australia and to places all over the world so it 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 uh it's been a long time since they already got international and so many people from abroad and also famous people came to Lech for their winter holidays for this region of austria uh, what airport do you recommend people fly to uh so as Vorarlberg is really in the west of austria the best way to get to Vorarlberg is to fly into zurich it's very easy to get to Vorarlberg from Innsbruck. It's an easy train ride. Um, another option is Munich or uh, during winter time, often, they often offer flights to Innsbruck as well, which is also very close. So I would say those are the best airports to fly to. And when in Vorarlberg, it's very easy to get uh, to travel by tr uh, public transportation. Our trip started in the capital, Vienna, and we had a bit of a free day to kind of like hang around, do whatever we want. And we got to meet one of our listeners, which you'll hear about in a second. But we were staying in a hotel called the Leo Grand Hotel. It was right smack bang in the middle. Like the location couldn't have been any better. And it was this honest, I don't even know where to start in describing this place. It was the most beautiful hotel, ornate staircases and just like, Everything's so, um, what's the word? Opulent. It was so opulent. Ooh, I remember thinking it was obviously a very old and historic building, but it, at the one, on the one hand, it was old. On the other hand, it felt brand new because I think yes. it had recently been done up. But you know what I mean? It, like, it looked old and amazing, but it also looked brand spanking new. And it's like one of the most fanciest places I've ever stayed in my life. And like you said, smack bang in the centre. But yeah, it's called Leo Grand. And I kept seeing lots of things related to Leo Leonardo DiCaprio. Like, for example, on the breakfast menu, all the dishes were related to the films that he was in. So like, catch me if you can. But it was like, catch catch the eggs if you can and it was kind of like <laughs> puns on it and we appreciate a pun don't we yeah there's definitely something about Django Unchained I'm not sure like Bacon Unchained I don't know like we're, <laughs> we are making it up now but then we're thinking well I, this must be like owned he must own it yeah and he doesn't <laughs> no I went up to reception and was like I mean is Leonardo DiCaprio here or and she was like no I don't know what you're talking about and I was like the menu is all about him and she was like oh no you're right but no there's there's no link there so there you go imagine the staff being like oh yeah <laughs> 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 I mean, I think you should get to know your own menu. It was amazing. Can't can't recommend it enough. It was so, as the name suggests, it was so grand. 
And staying on with the opulent, uh, I mean, the whole trip was opulent, to be honest. Everywhere we stayed was very luxury. It was it was incredible. But uh, one of our first nights there, we were invited to a dinner at the Belvedere Palace. How posh was that sentence? But this place, even if you're not invited to dinner there, I'd recommend going because there's a Klimt gallery there. And Klimt is the, uh, you would definitely know, even if you're not into art, you would definitely have seen his work, uh, his famous painting, The Kiss. And they've got these really beautiful gardens out the back. So that's the Belvedere Palace. That's another recommendation when you are in Vienna. Amy, we've come a long way since those days of eating cow brain sandwiches on the streets of Egypt. (laughs) Yeah, I think you paid about 20p for your breakfast that day. Now we're staying at the Leo Grand Hotel and going for dinner at at Belvedere Palace while (laughs) looking at original (laughs) Klimt's. You can't. Why do you keep adding a P into it? It's Klimt. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> I, th- I thought it was a bit of like a ch- it's like ch- chimped. Actually, I'm not going to tell you what to, what to say because I, I'm not sure I'm even getting it right. But I'm, I think it's climped. But let's move on. We got chatting online with a what the phone listener who lives in Vienna. Enter Lana. Hi, I'm Lana. Uh, I'm the owner of Museum of Illusions in Vienna. We thought, what better way to explore the capital than with a local? We met Lana at a restaurant. She was sat outside under a parasol. The sun was shining. It was a beautiful autumn sunny day in Vienna. People were going about their business. Oh, someone's waving at us. (laughs) We can go this way. Hey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm glad you waved. We were were thinking. We're like, we don't know what she looks like. We actually spent most of the day or afternoon with Lana. She showed us all the sites, including her own museum, the Museum of Illusions. Is it? Whoa. Einstein? Einstein? Yeah, Albert Einstein. It's following you, right? Oh, wow, yeah. But she mainly told us about life in Vienna. Life in Vienna is wonderful, very peaceful. Um, very organized, calm, family friendly, and I would say it's uh, it, it is the best city to live in. <laughs> yeah, it got the price uh, for the best city to live in, and this is true. Yeah. Uh, you have the good, st- uh, really good standard of living here. For example, when you just take into account the apartments in Vienna, uh, Vienna owns 220,000 of apartments, Vienna city itself. So they're keeping the rent quite low. Otherwise it would blow up like London or Paris or Berlin or whatever. So you can, I think with your salary, you can live very, very good here. You have 14 salaries in Austria. So you have the one for Christmas. You get the entire salary that you can spend on Christmas gifts or skiing. And then you have one for summer. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow, I've never heard of something like that. So with these salaries, so you've said about living costs, but in terms of food, going out, things like that, is is it an expensive life here? I could say like before the pandemics, let's talk about that. Now it's more expensive than it used to be. It wasn't this expensive. Um, the prices were quite normal. You could uh, afford yourself a lunch every day during uh, lunch break, like from work. Uh, you can you could go out drink cocktails go every weekend out wasn't with your with us every salary you could do all that and pay the apartment now it's a little bit more difficult but i think everywhere is like that it's not just vienna at the moment and regarding nightlife um well that's maybe a little bit of a minus Uh, vienna is more of a branch city saturday is very uh, popular to have brunch here but nightlife not maybe so much so you're not actually from here where are you from and why do you live here (laughs) I'm from Croatia and I came here when I was 18 years old to study uh, architecture and then I stayed here for now it's been 22 years so very high standard of life very organized we haven't been here very long but the city is so beautiful but how does the city smell <laughs> Very romantic. <laughs> it has a romantic smell. Like, let's call it like that. So we do have lots of horses and uh, carriages, and yeah, horses do produce uh, shit. <laughs> shit. <laughs> so you do have this smell, but it it just uh, takes you back to into past. past or into like, nature as well. You, exactly. it's, it has got a city smell. It's got a nature smell. Yes. Let's say. It's not. And it's not everywhere, is it? It's no. uh, no. just when, in parts. Tell us about your, your museum, which you just took us around and was so much fun. 
Yeah, the Museum of Illusions, uh, where everything is not what it seems. <laughs> I would describe it like that. You're, we have different rooms, installation, optical illusions. I mean, you're, you let your mind play tricks on you. And then you can discover why do you see, uh, why do you perceive some things the way you do. We have explanations with every uh, illusion. And it's a very fun museum. It's not the traditional one. Uh, you can you can laugh, you can run around, joke around. You don't have to be quiet. <laughs> yeah, take lots of pictures. Uh, you, yes, lots of pictures, and you just enjoy yourself for an hour or so. How can people find your museum? Oh, we're in the city center in the Walnerstrasse, close to Kolmarkt. Uh, you can come with the subway, U3, U3, or you can just walk around from the main square. It's really close. Now, before heading on to our Daddy Issues game for this episode, <laughs> Nick is going to bore us with a little bit of history. <laughs> it's not, well, I don't think it's going to be boring. And it's very important. A lot of people, I think, don't realise just how important Austria is. And although it's an amazingly beautiful, safe, nice, peaceful place to live nowadays, that hasn't always been the case. Okay, hello, my name is Ilse. Um, I am a tour guide in Vienna. I've been doing that for the last nine years and I love my job. <laughs> Although Austria is a relatively small country today, it has a very grand past. The former emperor Franz Joseph I, he was trying to unite his monarchy despite all of the nations wanting to be independent. Franz Joseph had a bit of a rough time. His wife got stabbed and his nephew was assassinated in 1914 by a Serbian underground movement. So one month after this assassination, uh, Franz Joseph declared war on Serbia and um, thought it would be an easy thing to uh, take Serbia over, but uh, calculated in the wrong way. So um, it was the beginning of World War I. So in fact, with that, he started World War I, right? And then... Austria lost, or the Habsburg monarchy lost, and after that, the monarchy broke apart. All the countries became independent, and what was left was only the German-speaking part of Austria, very small, from 55 million inhabitants to 6.5 million after that. So the Austrians actually, um, after the war, were quite lost, not only because everything Many things were destroyed and they struggled with jobs and everything, but also with national identity because you had this long history and you identified with the royal family. So then um, they thought of their German roots, right? The Austrians thought, okay, we have such a long tradition. We have uh, German roots, we have Swiss roots, the Habsburgs were Swiss. We had Bavarian settlements here in Vienna as well. So the German culture, language, tradition, everything is, is in common with Germany. So the idea really came after World War I to join Germany, right? But this thought was not yet a Nazi um, thought, right? But it was a normal idea in the brains of the people to be uh, a more important country, right? And not this small leftover from the monarchy. You can think of World War I and World War II as one war, but with a 21-year break in the middle. But why not class them as two wars, like the names suggest? Well pretty much all of the losing nations were not happy with how World War I ended. So the reason for World War II was World War I. In life, seemingly insignificant things can happen which have major consequences. A young Austrian man was declined twice by an art school in Vienna, which led him to fight in World War I. But why is this relevant? Well, that young man was Adolf Hitler. He travelled to Munich after World War I to start his political career which gained momentum quickly, and he was able to change the perspective of German culture from a positive to a negative with Nazism. And so Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Then we had the Austro-Fascist system here from 1934 to 38. So the path was there directly to the Nazi regime. Hitler came to 
Austria in 1938. So that's a way to put it, but actually we call it the so-called Anschluss, which was done on the 15th of March, 1938. And then Austria was part of Nazi Germany and uh, uh, World War II was started by Hitler by invading Poland, right? Mm. So this is it. And also, you know, after the war, because you said the negative uh, history, Austria was first recognized to be the first victim um, of Nazi Germany. But still then people thought about it because it was not only a victim because there were Nazis here as well, right? So there were different ways to to, to uh, deal with it. And Austria well, started quite late to deal with its past, so like 70s, 80s. And then people really started to say, yeah, we have to talk about it and think about what is the role of Austria actually in World War II and to prevent that for the future. So nowadays, Austria is very, very uh, conscious about that and tries to teach the children and history classes. We learn a lot about it because we really want to prevent that for the future. And I think Austria is doing quite Oh, very well with that, um, because yes, we have to learn from history. So thanks to Ilsa there. <laughs> Okay, daddy issues. You might be thinking, what on earth? I know this is what the foe and they do these kind of innuendo games, but there's a real big link to Austria and daddy issues. And that, my friend, is called Sigmund Freud. Now, if you don't know who he is, he's an Austrian neurologist. So that's a person who treats the nervous system. He invented the treatment of mental illness and neurosis by means of psychoanalysis. So I have a lot to thank to him because, you know, I've had therapy before and he's kind of like the grandfather of it all. Now, I'm I'm actually such a fan of Freud. I did my degree in photography and my whole final project was based on his work through the means of photography. Now, the reason that he does link this game is because he came up with the concept of daddy issues. And that's all based on the Oedipus complex, which if you don't know the story of Oedipus, it's a bit (laughs) messed up. (laughs) It's when (laughs) basically this guy, this son kind of falls in love with his mum and therefore is like against his dad. It's very strange. But the theory says that a child forms a strong attachment with a parent of the opposite sex and has feelings of competition towards their same sex parent. Freud identified this behavior with boys and their mothers. So that's boys and mums. <laughs> These I've never had to explain a game so much in my life. <laughs> it's almost not going to be worth, is it? So that's boys and their mums. Now girls with daddy issues. Freud suggested that a girl's personality shifts when she realizes that she does not have the same sexual organ similar to their opposite sex parents, therefore a penis. When they realize that they don't have it, they have something called penis envy. Can you now imagine what my photography project was about? (laughs) (laughs) But, well, because she can see she doesn't have a penis, she believes she was previously castrated. I mean, I'm, this is me summing it up. It gets, it's very deep. So this makes them develop a dislike for their own kind and want to spend more time with their father and later other males in order to make them feel complete. So this is where daddy issues was born, guys. So we're going to take a quiz to see if we have daddy issues. Yeah, let's find out. Do you get turned on by grey hair and beer bellies? And <laughs> if ever I have like coffee or like beer on my breath, Amy's like, oh, that reminds, that reminds me of my dad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not say that. You liar. <laughs> Anyway, should we take this highly scientific test to find out, Amy, if me and you have daddy issues? Let's do it. Okay, here we go. Question number one for me and Amy. Which type of guy (laughs) attracts you the most? You've got the options are nice, bad, familiar. I don't know. Mm, I'll go for nice. Okay, I guess you're just kind of thinking about women, are you? Is that how this whoa, is? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm taking the <laughs> test. Let me. Okay. You worry about your own answers. <laughs> I'm worrying about mine. What type of guy do I like? Nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say What's nice. What's the problem? 
I, no, nothing. <laughs> Next question. What do you think about the idea of sugar daddy? I love the English of this, of sugar daddy or a sugar daddy. The picture's a little disturbing. I mean, it's, it is an older man licking his finger. <laughs> yeah, there's two men. Okay, one's older than the other. They could be father and son, uh, but the son figure, they're both fully grown. He's got his finger in his mouth. He has got daddy issues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a sugar daddy. Well, so like sugar daddy is like a man that pays for you. Yeah, there's no attraction there. There's no feelings. He just pays for you. So the options are it's toxic. My partner likes it. I love it. People think <laughs> I like it. <laughs> for giggles, I'm going to go for people think I like it. I'm saying it's toxic. Okay. Next question. How difficult is it for you to trust men? Good question. See, now, I think if I'd taken this test 10 years ago, I would be answering very differently, wouldn't I? Yeah, and I just true. feel like I've healed myself. I now have a very good relationship with my dad. And I think that, I actually think that changes a lot. I think Freud would be like, yes, 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 No, I was <laughs> <laughs> Cut. <laughs> I was going to try and do an Austrian accent there. I was going to make it sound like Toto Wolf, but yeah. no, I think Freud would be proud of me because I've done some psychoanalysis and uh, now I, I haven't got daddy issues anymore. So my answer could be quite boring. But is it difficult for you to trust men? Somewhat easy, somewhat difficult, very difficult. I cannot trust them anymore. I feel like I'm going to say somewhat easy because you don't just instantly trust someone but like I have no reason to distrust other men because you're the only one I need to trust fully I'll say the same thing somewhat easy next has any of your relationships ended because you could not trust the person oh good question um <laughs> one option is kind of or I wanted to end it but I couldn't uh I'd say fortunately I mean we've been in a relationship for a long time so luckily we haven't had to go through a lot of the ups and downs of dating uh, it has been a long time actually because today is our anniversary today we've been together for 15 years Wee. and I know what you're thinking oh my god like you two sound super young Jesus how long when did you get together <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were we were quite young when we got together I mean I was 17 Nick, yeah, Nick went for the youngins. <laughs> of age. <laughs> and Nick was 19. So yeah, 15 years. Technically, we could have a teenage kid right now. But luckily that didn't happen. Anyway, <laughs> back to the quiz. I guess I'll have to say no. Ended the relationship because you couldn't trust them. I'd say yes, but actually my other relationships descended because they didn't give me enough attention because I had daddy issues. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say yes, though. Yeah. Actually, maybe... I might say yes. It's a stretch, but like, you remember, this might not go in the podcast. Uh, like, I had the girlfriend for like three months, but we didn't really yeah. spend much time together. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just didn't talk. Was that L beginning? Was that L beginning with name? Was that name beginning with L? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did, did. Before I met Amy, I did have a girlfriend for like a few months, but. <laughs> I did, I did have a girlfriend. I promise. <laughs> we didn't really talk much, and I'd be like, have a nice weekend. Bye. <laughs> Which is weird now. I would never say that to you or, or a girlfriend. I don't think it was even a week. I swear, like, you'd go like a whole week without even speaking. <laughs> it's so strange. She had many chances to cheat. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's say yes. Make it more interesting. <laughs> Next. If he loves me, his attention will be mine 24-7. Do you agree? <laughs> This is where this quiz heats up for me. 100%. If you're not giving me attention, I feel like I've been abandoned, that you're going to divorce me. <laughs> so I can give the answer, my partner thinks this way. <laughs> you can. And you can say yes. Next question. How long does it take you to move on and start a new romantic relationship? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it'd probably be different with you because we've been together for 15 years, but... The options are one to two years, six months, or six moths, as it says on this. <laughs> it's a very good scientific quiz. <laughs> one to two weeks or a very long time. For me, it's a one to two week job. Get in, get out, get over <laughs> it, and get under someone else. <laughs> out of those options, I would agree one to two weeks, because otherwise six months, that's a bit too long. A year, no. So So if you could choose your own option, what would you go? Would you split the difference, go three months? Yeah, two or three months. Would it be the same for me? or like, would, How long did it take you to get over me? A very long time. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Do you feel like all men are cold and distant before they fall in love with you? 
Hmm. No. no. I think that's probably the time where men are the most, like, hot and close, <laughs> rather than cold and distant. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Not that I know. <laughs> what, when they're trying to get in your pants? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, then finally, when you're like, okay, I'll be your girlfriend, then he's like, I'm watching the football. Can you shut the f*** up? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it was kind of fake, isn't it? The men chase the women at first, and then I think it shifts. Yeah. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no. Next question. Which one sounds like what your father would do to you oh god, <laughs> oh god what, what are these know. options I don't, I don't know what these options are going to be honey lingus <laughs> <laughs> jokes <laughs> the options are he listens to me he ignores me he hurts me he forgets me mm. Ooh, I don't want to put my dad down in this because we've got a good relationship now but what he used to do was different well, I mean th- that makes it sound like he hurt me he's never he's never done that just me like it was probably more ignores me but I, he probably did and I was just being a bit of a drama queen I'm gonna go for for my dad ignores because when I'm talking to him giving him like major life updates I can see a glazed over look in his eyes <laughs> so I'm gonna go for that one parents never listen do they let's go with he ignores me for both okay which one of the following statements is true about you? I love myself. My partner makes me hate myself. <laughs> I hate myself. I don't deserve love. Wow. I mean, it sounds really sad, but most of my life I've thought I don't deserve love. But now I'd say I love myself. And that's all thanks to therapy, I'd say. Yeah, I agree that that's how you feel and that's how I feel. Hey, next question's a big one. Do you think aggressiveness in the bedroom is sexy? I don't even need to see the options for this. Yes, sir. (laughs) You can say yes. If I'm being honest, I'm fine with it, but it's not like my thing. I'd rather you just submiss. (laughs) 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 Just give in. Uh, (laughs) um, So I'm going to say not sure. (laughs) And final question. Have you ever wondered why your boyfriends treat you like your dad? (laughs) Rarely, sometimes, always, not sure. I don't think there's ever been a day where you've done something and I've gone, huh, that's just like dad does it. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Uh, So the only, uh, rarely is the only option there we can tick, isn't it? Sometimes, always, not sure. Yeah, rarely. Right, we can now get our results. I'm clicking next. Let's find out what my results are. Well, you go first, Amy. It says I don't have daddy issues. Whee! Well done. How do you feel about that? Uh, Yeah, I think if I took this test maybe 10 years ago, it, it would have said, oh my God, go to therapy right now. You have the most daddy issues ever. But now I, I, I'm good. I'm all good. I've, I've done the work on myself and uh, I've got a good relationship with my dad. I've got a good relationship with you. It's all good. I agree. And I also don't have daddy issues. Isn't that great news? Fantastic. Congratulations on that, Nick. I think it does say, though, uh, you might feel your relationship with your father wasn't entirely healthy, and you might be right, but the thing (laughs) is that your responses are not similar to a person with daddy issues. Is that what yours says? Yes, it's exactly the same. Right, so that was daddy issues. Now back to the task in hand, Austria. The next place that we visited is located in the heart of the Tyrolean Alps and it's called Seefeld. This was my favourite name. I feel like it just sounds good, doesn't it? Seefeld. Seefeld. Yeah, you can, you can kind of say it with an accent, can't you? And now this is the land of the sound of music. Well, it's not. Amy thought it was, but it's not. That's Salzburg. And that's quite far away. I still think, yeah, it's like two hours apart, but I still think it has got a link. But if you've seen The Sound of Music and what it looks like, you know, when like everything looks photoshopped in the sense of like the grass is super green, all the colours are really vibrant. That's what it's like in real life and in Seafeld as well. Like it particularly looked like it. I mean, we haven't seen the film all the way through. We tried to before going on this trip. We thought, let's do a bit of research because... I mean, throw ahead to the latter part of this episode. We went to dinner with the Von Trapp family because that's how we roll these days. But yeah, we tried watching the film before, but we're not into musicals 
at all. Like it is not our thing. And oh, guys, we tried and like we love Austria, but we tried really hard to get through the film while we were packing and we had to turn it off. I just couldn't. I'm not into singing. I couldn't stand it. It was as soon as that guy was singing to that woman and they were clearly both like 30 years old, but he was singing, you are 16, going on 17. <laughs> At that point, we thought, no. <laughs> we, we don't want no part of this. No, yeah, it was, it was a bit too much. And I know people that love it are just diehard fans. And you particularly should go to Austria because I'm sure you'd, you'd get even more extra out of it. So, but yeah, all I want to say is that Seafeld is beautiful, like such a stunning part of the country for sure. Yeah, Seafeld is very, very beautiful. And so we've now left Vienna. We're pretty much the other side of the country, now in the state of Tyrol. And Tyrol is just a beautiful place. Mountains everywhere. You think classic Alpine Austria, Lederhosen's, yodeling. It's all there. Tyrol, there's also a part of Tyrol which goes into Italy as well. So there is a part of Italy that speak German. And I thought that was something to do with German people. But it's not. It's to do with Austrian people. Is that where Gunter from Drive to Survive is from? Oh, Because he's so. he's Italian, but he sounds Austrian Ger- or like, like German. Yeah, yeah. Speaks, yeah. speaks German, yeah. yeah. But Tyrol, this is like top place if you want some Alpine goodness. First of all, please be aware that you are now in the heart of the Alps. You're in the middle of the Alps. Yeah, and you are in the region Tyrol. So, first, Austria is divided into nine regions. Yeah? So, you were in Vienna. Yeah? Vienna is about 500 kilometers from the Tyrol, and the Tyrol is the most mountainous region of Austria. You're now in the west of Austria. We are about 760,000 Tyrolians yeah? and 9 million Austrians. Yeah? So, the rather famous capital of the Tyrol is Innsbruck, so former Olympic city. And the same Seefeld. Seefeld is a former Olympic village. Seefeld has about 3,500 inhabitants. Yeah? So it's an average village. Yeah? So 760,000 Tyrolians, so 3,500, it's an average village. Yeah? Um, it's the main village on the plateau, yeah? and there are still other four villages, yeah? so five villages on the plateau of Seefeld, but Seefeld is the, um, the main village. During our time in Seefeld, we stayed at the incredible five-star luxury alpine resort Saha. Some robes, nice. Oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> the bar... <laughs> Bathroom's Look like at the that. bathroom. Oh my god, the bath is like a window to the bed. The ba- uh, it's a huge bathroom, it's as big as our flat. Wow. Yeah, this is, very, this is very classy. crazy luxury. That view is insane. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Gürtler and we are now at the Sacher Alpine Resort in Seefeld. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here and I hope you feel very much at home. And it should be cozy you know alpine feeling it's an alpine hotel nevertheless it's also grand hotel and uh, what's a big luxury is to have space so this seems to be a vast hotel a big hotel but it only has 81 rooms but you have a lot of space so wherever you sit down you don't have the feeling somebody's bothering you and i think it's very important especially when you are in the spa it's a very intimate place. You don't want to have people very close to you. You must have your privacy. So therefore we offer a lot of space. But of course, people know what the spa can offer. So I think the idea to have in the Alps a hotel all year round working well means to have a big spa offering all the facilities. It means a number of pools. We have a sports pool being 20 meters, an indoor outdoor pool. You have um, a lot of uh, whirlpools, a saltwater whirlpool, another whirlpool. We have a number of saunas, you know, that's also important. Um, 
Of course, there are different cultures we have in Austria, in Germany, in Switzerland. Ladies and gentlemen, they go together naked into a sauna. But I know for the Americans, this doesn't work. <laughs> so we also have a textile sauna. We have a, ha a naked sauna. So I think that makes a lot of, gives the feeling what people now want to get, that during their vacation, they're doing something for loading up their energy to be again ready for all the stress they have to face when they go back to their job again. So nowadays they don't want to enjoy nights of parties and all such things. They want to have a healthy way to spend their vacation. And this is what we try to offer. And the altitude of 1200 meters is just the maximum you can make because there is less oxygen in the air, which means you have to inhale the air more intensively, which widens your lungs. And this has a very positive effect on your health status. It gives you more resistance. And therefore, I always say, if you want to do something, you have to do it not on an altitude of 500 or 600 meters. You have to go between 1,000 and 1,500. Mm -hmm. And therefore, all the, um, you say, soccer, the soccer teams like Milan and the German team, but also the Austrian team, they do their training here in Seefeld because this gives them more resistance and it widens their lungs, you know. Now, sauna is a massive part of Austrian culture. We're going to be talking about sauna or sauna in more depth on a future episode of What the Foe when we go to Helsinki, Finland, the home of sauna. And now, Amy, you had a chat with one of the journalists uh, who did get to do a sauna experience with a sauna master. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm a travel writer from Australia. I missed this as I was doing yoga and having a sound bath class. <laughs> Who the hell are you? <laughs> um, but I'll let Jen explain the entire experience for you. Yes, yeah, so it was a very interesting experience. So I didn't even know a sauna master existed. And this is my fourth time to Austria. And I thought, well, I'm going to embrace the sauna experience this time. And so I, I went down to the, the hotel's spa area and this guy came out just no shirt in a towel and he said oh you know come into the steam room and I thought this is interesting okay I'll embrace this and so he basically had a a schedule of you know an hour and a half to two hours of a, a spa experience so we started in the steam room and what that meant was that I was completely naked <laughs> completely no completely. swimming costume nothing 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 I could take a little towel to sit on uh, and he's this guy uh, explaining that he you know, how, how good steam is for your skin and opening up your pores. And he gave me some salt that I rubbed on my body. And then he came around and uh, sort of blew some air with a towel onto me. Uh, so this, it was getting really, really hot. And, uh, and then washed me, essentially. <laughs> Not touching me, but just throwing water onto me. So I thought, okay, this is different. <laughs> and then after that experience, you know, put your towel back on. We went outside for a while and had some fresh air. And he encouraged me to have about 20 minutes, 30 minutes of relaxation. And at the hotel, they had a beautiful area for relaxation. So, you know, you'd sort of read a book or you'd have some water and make sure you stay hydrated. And then we went into the sauna and the sauna was really beautiful. But that was another eye-opener because there were six men in the sauna and three women. I was so, so, yeah, totally mixed. There's no segregation, nothing. Totally mixed, totally. And you hang up your robe or your towel before you walk in. And you can take a towel, obviously, to sit on because the, the seats get really hot. But it's, you know, you, you get to the point where you get so hot and uncomfortable that you really can't be modest. You just have to sit in the most you know, the most comfortable position you can sit in and often that's showing everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think you're really brave. Like, is this the first time you've done anything like this? Completely, completely. I would, in Australia, we have saunas next to the, the gyms, for example, or next to a pool and you always keep your bikini on or your board shorts on. So, yeah, it was, I, ha I had been warming up to it for a couple of days in the previous hotel and they had a very small sauna. So I'd sort of watched the other women to see how they sat and to, you know, uh, I kind of eased myself into it, I guess, before this full throttle 
experience. Uh, but yeah, it was a little bit awkward to start with. But essentially in, in the sauna, he went through this lovely experience where he, you know, ladled some water onto the hot stones and he used some uh, some natural oils, rosemary and peppermint. And he did the same thing. He went around and used a towel to uh, put air onto you and and it got really, really hot. And then you'd go outside and you'd have a cold drink again. And, you'd, you know, a, a couple of times he'd give us some ice and we'd rub that on our face or we'd rub that on our legs. And, and so there was a ritual that he was from Turkey. So he had this ritual uh, that's obviously maybe he's learned back home. But it was, yeah, it was really interesting. And again, you'd have these relaxation experiences. And at one point I thought, well, everyone's seen me naked already. <laughs> I may as well go for a swim in the nud. <laughs> so there was a little pool and, you know, and that was quite beautiful as well. And sitting outside uh, in this pool. But there were men in the pool as well, naked, uh, you know, a metre away from me. I thought, okay, well, you know, no one's looking at it. No one's looking at each other, really. So it's, I mean, not obviously anyway. <laughs> Uh, and then we ended up, we went back into the sort, uh, the steam room afterwards and we lathered ourselves up with cream. And, and to be honest, it was, it was really liberating. It was uh, eye-opening to actually be in this place with men that didn't care. You know, we all had different bodies. We all um, were all different ages. You know, there were elderly people in there. I was, there were some younger 22-year-old guys in there, uh, mostly middle-aged probably but it's uh it was really interesting So towards the end of this episode, we're kind of jumping around a lot. I mean, we spoke about sauna. We're now going to talk about the Von Trapp family that we went to dinner with. <laughs> then, oh, I can never say this word, Swarovski, Crystal World. We're jumping all around and then we're talking about yodeling. So, but just stick with us, guys. You won't regret it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Nick, why why did we go to dinner with the Von Trapp family? <laughs> That's the sentence I didn't think I'd ever say. Yeah, it was mad so like our whole press trip group were invited to Friedberg Castle not too far from Seedfeld and Innsbruck close around that area and we were hosted by Count Gaudens and Countess Christine Trapp and that's right the Trapp family from The Sound of Music how cool was that? It was cool and it was like a farewell dinner with all the journalists that we were with we'd kind of all congregated together at the end for this farewell dinner three course meal in a castle and I just think like if you if you do go to Austria I would highly recommend trying to do a castle experience because it's I mean you'll see them just driving around the country you'll see a ton of castles I feel like everyone you meet is a count or countess so yeah they're just very I just feel like Austrian people are very like high society aren't they in a good way though like they're super nice super down to earth but they're just they're just so elegant talking about elegance and high society yeah so uh, yeah i know i keep saying i find it difficult to say this but yeah swarovski no swarovski crystals i think a lot of i i mean this might sound sexist but i think a lot of women would know what i'm talking about there swarovski crystals maybe the boys as well the lads out there <laughs> now they i didn't know this but they have Sorosky crystal world so it's a bit like a, a theme park minus the rides but like you know when you walk around a, a theme park and there's just like giant pieces of art and everything and things to do it's a bit like that and there's a building that you go into and then you walk around like a museum of all the history of it and where these crystals are in different films and music videos, it's really luxurious. But the bit that you walk in, it's like this massive hill, a bit like the Teletubby Hill, like a grass hill with a face in it. Do you remember that? I remember a waterfall coming out the face's mouth. Oh, yeah, it's a bit like a kind of like Maori face. So it's one of the most frequently visited attractions in Austria. So Svoros, oh, I can't say it. 
Swarovski Crystal Wells has delighted more than 15 million visitors since 1995. This place is absolutely massive. And you can see diamond earrings that Marilyn Monroe wore in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. You can see what Sarah Jessica Parker wore with her shiny, shimmering dress in Sex in the City. And one of my favourite facts, actually, is that for 13 years now, Swarovski have designed the star that glitters on top of the Rockefeller Christmas tree in New York. So it became an iconic part of New York's holiday traditions. And last year, the star weighed 550 pounds and contained 25,000 crystals and measured over 9.5 feet in diameter. That's massive. Madness. If you like your crystals, go to Austria. But yeah, really cool place. I would highly recommend. Now, throughout this episode, you've heard some yodeling music. Now, we've got something special to to play for you guys. We couldn't quite believe our ears when we heard this live performance. We're in Innsbruck at this point, and we had a live performance from this this couple, this man and this woman. And, well, I'm going to shut up so you can hear it. I don't think there's any words for this. friends is a woman in Innsbruck with her husband I believe doing like a yodel song about a cow we can believe this the noise that was coming out of her mouth she didn't really even pull any like strange faces you'd think like to get that kind of throat noise to come out she just looked normal like it's almost like you could walk in that room look around and be like who on earth is making that noise but she just looked normal do you want to give it a go yeah I like yeah, I mean, you explain, <laughs> you explain yodeling and then let's have the yodel competition. Okay, let me explain. Now, yodeling is still a major feature of folk music from Switzerland, Austria and southern Germany, like Alpine, Germanic countries. And originally, yodeling was used to call cow flocks. But more importantly, it was also used to communicate from village to village and mountain to mountain. Uh, for these communities that are separated by deep alpine valleys and rugged terrain. Okay, so for our yodeling competition, are we actually going to kind of yodel like Dominic did at the start in language lessons, or are we going to try the cow noise? Well, I'm going to do both. Dominic was my favourite, so I'm going to try to imitate him, but let's also give our our, our cow effort. Yeah, okay. Play Dominic's again. (laughs) Okay, can I follow that? Yeah! I don't like it. (laughs) At first, it sounded like a really creepy laugh. (laughs) I think we're definitely going to have to upload this on Instagram just so people can see your face. That was a bit better, wasn't it? (laughs) Yeah, okay. Shall I try and do the same noise? Okay. Yeah. I feel like mine's going to come out cowboyish. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. So the, this is our official entry into the yodel competition for our Austria episode. Nick, go. Okay. <laughs> you really like shake your head as you go up like this. I'm going to use your technique because I feel like it's working for you. Right, ready? <laughs> oh, that was good, actually. Especially, it started off really well. We live in an apartment block. I feel like our apartment's uh, like neighbours are going to be like, what on earth is going in there? The cow? Okay. I, I've never in my life tried this. I don't know how, because it can't, really comes from her like nasal area, then her nu- uh, throat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, I'm going to go. No. <laughs> You're literally saying the words like M O O. Moo. I was trying to get it from my throat. I mean, whenever I've done a cow impression before, not often, it's been more like. No, that was wrong. Uh... <laughs> okay. No. Not bad. No. Oh, you sound like you're going to be sick. That's horrible. Okay. All right. I'm done. That's our yodel competition. Right. Let's talk about our next episode. So Austria part two 
We are going into the mountains. This is the only place in Austria where you can ski all year round. So moving through these little ice caves within the glacier. Holy shit, that's so cold. That's horrible. Yeah, like that's instantly painful. You want to ski, but you also want to party and get laid in the evening. <laughs> where would you recommend in Austria? Oh, do I have a place for you? <laughs> um, it's more adventurous than I thought it was going to be. In Austria, are you famous? <laughs> Brother me, we actually very famous. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> because of other things which I don't want to tell you. <laughs> See you then. Bye. Danke. Before we wrap this up, we've got a question for you. Is your boy Tarquin going on a gap year? Is your gal pal Rachel off to eat, pray, love herself silly? Then the best way to support this show is to share it with all your travel buddies. Thanks, Thanks bye! bye. <laughs>